on the Atlantic Ocean. And in Marblehead Harbor, uh, the town that we lived in, uh, there were, it was sort of a yachting area, lots of sailboats and things. And so in this harbor, there were, oh, I don't know, dozens, maybe, maybe more than a hundred um, sailboats or small to mid-sized yachts, that sort of thing in this harbor. Uh, I did not own one of them. But um, lots and lots of boats in the harbor that never bumped into each other, even though the harbor was crowded. And of course, the reason for that was that each of these boats had an anchor that kept it in one place, right? But that's not quite the whole story. An anchor never keeps a boat in exactly one place, does it, right? The fact is, this is the ocean, and so the tides would come in, and that would mean that the water was deeper, and so you needed a longer rope, and other times the tide would go out, and the water was more shallow, and so the rope had a little more play in it. Sometimes there were winds blowing, and so all of the boats were swinging around in one direction, and sometimes the wind would blow in the other direction. You have the picture in mind? But the boats never hit one another because they were always tethered to the anchor. No matter how far the wind blew them north or south or east or west, the anchor holds. You have the picture in mind with me? This has been kind of a tumultuous week here in our church. Right? Some of you are familiar with this. There have been, uh, there, there's the ecstatic joy of a newborn baby. This is the Lazowski baby, born yesterday, Brooke Elizabeth Lazowski. Thanks be to God. There's the uh, optimism and excitement of a wedding in the Shirk family. Some of you know Jessica Shirk, who was married yesterday. But there's also the kind of paralyzing horror of, of a tragic death and a funeral service in this room yesterday. And as it happens, that occurs on the anniversary of a terrorist attack that still kind of shakes our world. And of course, we're in the midst of the continuing uncertainties and instabilities associated with COVID and so forth. A tumultuous time when we need an anchor. We need something that will not move, something that stabilizes us, whether we're doing really well or doing not so well. Our aim today is to follow a biblical pattern that provides that. The pattern comes from Psalm 136. We'll be reading that some uh, as we go. It's one of those psalms that has a consistent refrain in every single verse that says, His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Every single line. So, as in biblical times, we will be reading such things responsively. And can I remind you that responsive reading does not mean simply that we take turns reading. In a sense, it's not taking turns reading, it is taking turns declaring, it's taking turns preaching to one another the truth that we know. Can we try it with a text like this? I begin, then you preach with me with some boldness. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. That is a lovely sound. Thank you. Thank you. So as in biblical times, we will read in this way. Interestingly enough, as some of you know, the biblical kind of picture, um, when they do things responsively, usually that means that there are two groups of Israelites that are standing on two adjacent mountains or hilltops. And so they are shouting to one another from the one side to the other reminding each other of the truths that we believe. We're going to do some of that today, too. We'll have the north side preaching sometimes. We will have, led by Johnny here. Johnny's going to help us. Uh, the south side 
the preachers uh, with Amy to give us some guidance there. So again, could I ask that we take seriously that duty of preaching to one another on the north? Your job is to speak to the people on the south so that they hear and believe. On the south, your job is to make sure that nobody in the furthest row on the north side fails to hear the word of God. We speak to one another. You get the idea? Can we try it once again? Uh, let me ask, if I could, that on the north, you preach the word of God to your brothers and sisters. Um, give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Can we try it on the south? Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. And once more, we'll do it together. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. Brothers and sisters, I think we are ready to worship. <laughs> Could I ask that we take just a moment? You may want to focus on these capitalized words or the words we're going to say again and again. His love endures forever. Let's get that in our minds. Let's look for a stable place to stand. Let's look for an anchor that holds us. Take a moment, prepare your own heart, and then we'll begin with a song. Stay seated, sing quietly. It's a song you'll recognize. Let's prepare for the Lord's presence. Brothers and sisters, we gather today with the aim of seeing the face of God, our stable resting place, the anchor that will hold on to us, something larger than our joys, something larger than our sorrows. We want to see the face of God. He invites us into his presence. Hear the word of God from Psalm 90. Just a couple of verses, familiar ones. You'll recognize them. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, our anchor will hold. Come, we want to enter into his presence today. Can we begin with our anchor, the response that we'll continue to repeat? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, his love, love endures, endures forever. Come, will you stand and sing with me? If you're using the hymnal, we'll be on page 17. Let's stand.
Again, think of the words that we started with, from everlasting to everlasting. This is our God, from everlasting to everlasting. Do those words leave you feeling rather small? Anytime we approach this God, his grandeur and glory are over us and ahead of us, and perhaps before we approach him, we had better deal with the places in which we are not ready for that kind of grand presence. Take a moment, if you would, in silence to confess your sins before God, to turn aside from them, to ask his forgiveness. Amen. By the end of Psalm 90, everlasting to everlasting, Moses has the courage to pray to God these words. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. The favor of God, the everlasting favor. What Moses asked for in faith, in hope, you and I have now seen with our eyes, fast forward a thousand years, we have seen the Lord come. We have seen his life and death and resurrection. We have seen God's favor displayed. Remember the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 6? Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Remember the angelic song that announced the coming of Christ from Luke chapter 2. You know this. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those on whom his favor rests. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, that is you. The favor of God has come and your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. That's an anchor that we can hold on to. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. His love endures forever. We're going to see that more and more, for this now is the way that we celebrate the gospel. We begin with Psalm 136, where we'll celebrate the gospel by doing the same thing that the Israelites did. So, that means we do our back and forth movement. Uh, this, All of the, the words for the... Um, for these uh, readings are printed in the bulletin and it may be a little easier for you to follow the left and right movement there. If you want to, that's beginning on page three in your bulletin. Words will be projected here as well. Friends, with boldness, we celebrate the great love of God which endures forever. We celebrate it in creation. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the sea upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. Let's sing together. Number 111, if you're using the hymnal. We'll sing all three stanzas.
this time and let's read together from Psalm 136. We celebrate God's enduring love, not just in creation, but throughout Israel's history. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. His love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them. His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the desert. His love endures forever. And gave them land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. To the one who remembered us in our low estate. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. And who gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. Let's be seated again. And we'll sing together number, hymn number 34, The God of Abram Praise. Israel celebrated by faith, we have seen with our eyes. Let's stand and we continue to think about God's enduring love from 1 Corinthians 15. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love, love endures forever. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. His love endures forever that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. His love endures forever. That he was buried. His love endures forever. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. His love endures forever. That he appeared to Peter. His love endures forever. And then to the twelve. His love endures forever. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. His love endures forever. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. Let's sing.
As you know, the victory of Christ did not end with the resurrection. It was accomplished, but it continues throughout history. Sometimes we see it clearly, sometimes not so much. Throughout that history, God's enduring love has been present, uh, stabilizing the church. One way that Christians have celebrated that is through the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to ask that we do the creed continuing the response back and forth sort of pattern. Um, so we'll ask men, if you would, to do the lines of the creed themselves. They're in the bulletin. They'll be displayed here. Um, men will be speaking the creed, and women, after each line, it's the same thing. His love endures forever. Forever. <laughs> will you do that with me? Christian, what do you believe? I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty. His love endures forever. Maker of heaven and earth. His love endures forever. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. His love endures forever. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. His love endures forever. And born of the Virgin Mary. His love endures forever. He, he suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Pilate. His love endures forever. Was crucified, died, and was buried. His love endures forever. He descended into hell. His love endures forever. The third day he rose again from the dead. His love endures forever. He ascended into heaven. His love endures forever and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. His love endures forever. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. His love endures forever. I believe in the Holy Spirit. His love endures forever. The Holy Catholic Church. His love endures forever. The communion of the saints. His love endures forever. The forgiveness of sins. His love endures forever. The resurrection of the body. His love endures forever. And the life, and the life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, His love endures forever. Amen. Will you join me, please, as we pray together? Living God, most holy, from everlasting to everlasting, whose love endures forever. What great truths we, we hear in the creed, we read in our Bibles, we proclaim as we worship. Our bedrock, our anchor, oh, hold us tight, Lord God, you have done this and we count on that. Even in the midst of all of the things that we encounter this week, individually, or as a church, or as a, as a world, all of the trembling that is still associated with a world in the, in the grip of a pandemic, and the particular kinds of trembling that come with the 9-11 remembrance yesterday, and a world that is still characterized by such things. Oh, our God, your love endures forever. Grant that we should be rooted there. And in the midst of the individual hardship that we face, I am thinking of the Dilworth family especially. Oh, God. For them, for Kyle and Heather, for others affected by this, for a widow without her husband, 
O Lord, have mercy and let your enduring love stabilize them. Grant that they can know a truth that is larger than death and can live in the midst of that even today. Would you do that? And in other hardships or difficulties that we face, you know each one. Show us the enduring love that anchors our souls. That anchors them in the midst of our joys too. Oh, when we are high, we rejoice that it's your love that we are singing an echo of. When I think about the birth of this new baby to Mark and Emily Lazowski, we give you thanks. When we think about the new beginning for Jessica Shirk, no longer Shirk, as she moves into wedded life. Oh God, grant that they should be blessed, that others too that are celebrating anniversaries and joys and relationships and beauties of all kinds. It is your love that we live in the midst of, for your love endures forever. In our joys, in our sorrows, your love endures. Father, we pray that you will go ahead of us as we try to live in the midst of your love in this season for our church. I'm thinking of the Sunday school classes that began this morning here, fall classes. Go ahead of us and let us see the glory of God. And during this week and things that are going on, I'm thinking of the men's dinner that I know uh, takes place on Thursday night, but other events too. Will you help us, O Lord, that we can see your beauty and love and rock-solid stability in the midst of it? Just in these days when we feel easily oppressed or afraid or anxious, even in the midst of our joys, our highest joy does not increase the solidity of your love which endures forever. And our deepest feeling of abandonment does not modify a whit to the greatness of your love. Though we cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet his love endures forever. We live in the midst of it. We pray that you will make it real in us, whether we can see it or not. And we give you thanks in the name of our great Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, can I ask you to stand and we have one more reading, one more song, and then we hear the word of God. We're thinking of the enduring love of God that lasts forever from Revelation chapters 11 and elsewhere. Let's proclaim the word of God to one another. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, his love, love endures forever. forever. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. His, his love, love endures forever. And there were loud voices in heaven. His love endures forever. Which said, the kingdom of the world. His love endures forever. Has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. His love endures forever. And he will reign forever and ever. His love endures forever. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude. His love endures forever. Like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder. His love endures forever. Shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. His love endures forever. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. His love endures forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. His love endures forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's sing together one last song. Number 318, we're singing it to a different, more familiar tune. But if you're looking at the, at the hymnal, then you'll want to be aware of that. 318, let's sing.
Please be seated. I always feel the oddity the day after a memorial service or a funeral when the sermon goes in a direction other than a psalm about such difficult things. I want you to know I feel that as I get here. I know the Lord has things planned the way he does for our good, and I know that every truth of Scripture is what we need even in our darkest times, not just the truths that we most naturally and understandably gravitate to, but I wanted you to know where my heart is today. People are known by their names, but also by their titles. Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. Emily and Mark Lasowski. Hey, Jim Turner. Coach. Hey, Paul Frisco, Chief. His grandkids call him Chief. Today in Matthew 16, we're looking at a passage where the name of Jesus is mentioned, but everything is all about his titles. It's a passage that we broke off from several years ago when working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and we came where Jesus came to the very northern tip of Israel in what was known as Caesarea Philippi, that is, the Caesarea that was uh, rebuilt in honor of uh, a man named Philip. And we come to verse 13 of Matthew 16, which is one of the more famous passages in the Gospel of Matthew. To some people, it's one of the more famous passages in the Bible. Matthew 16, verse 13 and following. Now, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Then down to verse 20. And then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. It probably hits every Christian at some time or another in his or her life that Jesus allowed people in his time to misunderstand who he was, some by a small margin, some by a long shot. Even casual observers of his day knew that Jesus was no ordinary man. You could tell that, but opinions about him varied. Uh, One writer said that uh, Satan was not a disabled was not able to dissuade the Jewish people from believing in a Messiah because it was all in the Old Testament. So instead, he calls them instead to have misunderstandings about who the Messiah was. Now, some of those people, when Jesus asked, who do people say that I am, had a totally dim view of him. The Pharisees called him Beelzebub, an awful name for Satan. His disciples didn't mention them when they asked when they were asked, but his disciples mentioned those who had a relatively high view of Jesus. Well, some say you're John the Baptist, and and others say you're Elijah, the great Old Testament prophet, or some say that you're Jeremiah or some other prophet. So let's think about this. People who thought that Jesus was someone other than who he was. Jesus let this happen. The first thing that people thought he was was John the Baptist. 
Now, some people thought this way because of a totally superstitious mindset. You may recall that King Herod had had John the Baptist put to death, beheaded. And then when Jesus came preaching, we read that, that Herod thought, oh my goodness, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and is out preaching again. He thought that a soul could leave a body and then go away and then maybe somebody else come and that soul go into that person. It was weird. Other people had a little wiser view who would have thought it was John the Baptist. I don't think most people thought literally that Jesus was John the Baptist. After all, thousands had seen him and John the Baptist together being baptized. No, instead, I think they thought of him as continuing the work of John the Baptist, of preparing for the Messiah. You may recall that John, when he baptized, said, no, 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 I'm not the Messiah, even though my preaching gathers these, these thousands of people here. No, I'm preparing the way for the Messiah. And in that similar way, I think that perhaps people thought, well, Jesus is another John the Baptist. He's preparing the way for the Messiah that's going to be here, but he's not the Messiah himself. Other people we read and we hear here thought that Jesus was Elijah. Did some of them think that he was Elijah literally? It's at least possible. The last book of the Old Testament, at least in English, is the prophet Malachi. And in the last chapter of the last book, here's what God promises. He says, see, 400 years before Christ this is now, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day when the Lord comes. That he had promised, that is, um, Malachi had promised, that the Lord will come and bring an end to this earth and judge the wicked and give his friends all kinds of honors and rewards and set up his throne, but he would send Elijah first. And some people thought, well, maybe John the Baptist had been Elijah. He had lived in the desert. He had worn rugged clothes. He had boldly denounced the sin of people. And Jesus, well, it's not like Jesus went around in rich clothes and he preached and sometimes he was out in the desert and he boldly denounced people and their sins. Maybe, maybe John the Baptist, maybe, I'm sorry, maybe Elijah really has come back. And other people perhaps thought that it was figurative when they said that maybe Elijah has come back. Um, you may recall that when John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, received a vision from an angel in the temple, the angel said to him, you're going to have a son. That son will be the go before the Lord's Christ. And he will go before the Lord, quote, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That is, your son, John the Baptist, will look a lot like Elijah. He'll talk like Elijah. He'll seem like Elijah. So much so that, that Jesus himself once referred to John as the Elijah that Malachi promised. In any case, whether people literally thought it or thought it was only um, that Jesus was like him, the idea was in their minds that Jesus was obviously a great man, some prophetic person, but that he was still a forerunner of the great Messiah, not the great Messiah himself. And then we read that the disciples said, some people think that you are Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Well, the idea is this, that uh, Jeremiah had boldly told people about judgment to come. And Jesus Christ often spoke about hell and about standing before the throne of God on the last day. Maybe that's what is about here. Maybe he is Jeremiah, literally, or Jeremiah figuratively, like Jeremiah. Or maybe he is, here's the phrase, just one of the prophets. That is, well, even though Jesus seems like a fairly special man, I mean, we know where he was born, and we know where he lives now. He lives in Nazareth, and Nazareth is not the town to be from if you want to impress anybody. And even though he seems like such an extraordinary person, and his miracles seem to say that, Maybe he's really just like one of the Old Testament prophets, great, but not the greatest. In other words, then, the idea is this. Many, saw people, many people saw Jesus as if he were from heaven, that is, sent from heaven, that is, that, that heaven commissioned him to do what he was doing. But no group of Jewish people openly confessed Jesus Christ to be the Messiah. The idea, then, is it is possible to have a vague idea of Jesus is, but not have a saving idea of who Jesus is. Or, or to put that better, Matthew Henry from the late 1600s, early 1700s, put it this way. <clears throat> it is possible to have good thoughts of Christ 
a high opinion of him. I'm sorry, let me read that. It is possible to have good thoughts of Christ and yet not right ones, to have a high opinion of him and yet not high enough. And this is clearly not an innocent thing. We tend to think if somebody misses the idea that Jesus is who we claim to be, that that's understandable, that folks missed it back then, certainly folks can miss it today, and it may just be a, um, a lack of information or, or a lack of ability to believe it. But here's the, what the Bible says. Instead, the Jewish people of Jesus' day said to him in John 10, 24, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, that is the same word as the Messiah, the one is Christ is the Greek word and Messiah is the Hebrew word. If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And yet Jesus had revealed himself by his miracles time and again to fulfill so many Old Testament prophets that for people whose hearts were soft and ready to respond to God, they were drawn to him. And yet he held back enough information about himself that for people who were resistors to God, they wouldn't see it and they would not embrace him as the Messiah. In other words, he gave us enough information that we would believe in him if our hearts were inclined toward God, but enough rope to hang ourselves if we were inclined to resist God. So that's the first great point. Jesus allowed people both then and today to misunderstand who he is. And of course, there are many people who do so today. It seems like in a great many Christian churches, at least churches that have the Christian name, Buildings that have a steeple, maybe buildings that have a cross out front. Jesus is misunderstood. He is often preached as a savior, as the one who came, the baby born in Bethlehem. But he's often preached as the person who is one among many ways to God. And that is so far from whom Jesus said that here you can have clergymen standing in front of a congregation, misunderstanding who Jesus is, even though they have somewhat of a high view of him. A second great fact that comes out of this passage is that the people who do understand Jesus, the people who do get who he is, see him as unique, absolutely different from anyone else on multiple levels. So you read in verse 15, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? The you in both cases is a plural. He's talking to all the 12. And Simon Peter, in verse 16, answered Jesus on behalf of the whole group. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, that is the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, hadn't the disciples affirmed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, earlier? Yeah, they had, but you can admit that Jesus is the Messiah and really not grasp what you're saying. You could have a misimpression about what that means. You couldn't confess it without complete uh, confidence that it's true. But here it's clear this is a great turning point in the Gospel of Matthew where Peter makes his solid confession about the identity of Jesus, and Jesus says that's good. Now, let's look at the terms Peter used when he confessed who Jesus was. Peter confessed in front of the whole group that Jesus was the Messiah or the Christ. Now, most of you probably know that the word Messiah or well, the word Christ means an anointed one. We might anoint ourselves with oil to make our face nice or something like that. Well, kings were anointed with oil on top of their head to show the Holy Spirit being poured out on them to give them the power to rule well and wisely. So in the Old Testament, kings of Israel were called Christ's, Messiah's. You may recall in Psalm 18, verse 50, just one example, um, we read that God gives his king, that is David, he gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his Messiah, to David and his descendants forever. English translations tend to translate that. He gives unfailing kindness to his anointed, but it's the same thing. So, just as some people are known, not just by their names, but by their titles, so this great one who was to come is known by the title, anointed one, king, Messiah. But God had promised that there would be a special anointed king, not just the average king of Israel, who was called an anointed one to Messiah. <clears throat> you may recall that he appeared to David, and he said to David, David, 
after you die, this is from 2 Samuel verse 17, verse 14 and following, after you die, you know, you will have a son, he's talking about Solomon there, and I will be his father, and he will be my son, and when he does wrong, I'll punish him with the rod of men and with the floggings inflicted by men, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul. God promises that David will have a son who would be king and anointed one the Messiah. But the promise of God looked beyond just Solomon, David's own boy. He looked into the future in David's descendants and said the following. God looked to a far greater descendant of David than Solomon or any other king or than David himself who would be the messianic son of God in the fullest sense of the word, the great anointed Messiah who would come and change everything. Here's how it went in 2 Samuel 7, 16. He said, he said, David, your house, that is your family, and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And the idea is picked up in Psalm 89 when God said it this way even more clearly. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever, and I will make your throne firm through all generations. I will appoint him, who is the him? It's some descendant in the future that's going to be particularly great. I will also appoint him as my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth, and I will establish his line forever and his throne for as long as the heavens endure. From the very beginning, people realized this was talking about some great son of David, great David's greater son who would come in the future and be exalted. God would so honor him, he would call him his firstborn. That is the most honored person in the family. And yet, as you read through the Old Testament, all the kings that are listed all of them were a disappointment. This promise never seemed fulfilled in any of the kings that ruled in Judah or Israel. And yet Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one. So he confessed that Jesus, I believe, and I'm speaking on behalf of the other 11, I believe that you are the one talked about in Psalm 89 and in 2 Samuel 7 and elsewhere that you are the great king that God has sent to make things right at the end. And yet, even though Peter confessed that, what he said went far beyond saying that Jesus was the Messiah because the Messiah had always been viewed by people as a great man, but still just as a man. But Peter now confessed a second title to Jesus. Peter confessed that Jesus was, quote, the son of the living God. I need you to know in all of these things, I, I am so dependent and so helped by such a wide range of scholars, George Alden Ladd, Alfred Edersheim, William Hendrickson, D.A. Carson, and others that so much of what I'm building is built right off of these men. When he called Jesus the son of the living God, the Bible uses the term son of God in different ways, four ways to be exact. And we need to think about which of those four ways did Peter mean when he called Jesus the Son of God. First, the Bible refers to people as sons of God just because they're human. They're created by God. Any human being is a creature of God and therefore is a son or daughter of God. So you get in Malachi 2 verse 10, <clears throat> Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? That's the idea. God created me, so he's a father, and I must be a son. Or the Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 17, when he's preaching to the Athenians, he said, although they were pagans, he said, didn't one of your own Greek poets say, quote, we are God's offspring? So, did Peter just mean that Jesus was the son of God and that he is a true human, and therefore he's a creature, and therefore God is in some sense his father? Or did Peter mean the second thing? The second way that the Bible uses the term son of God is when a person is, we might say, the object of God's special love. So you remember when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God had Moses go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, Jehovah says, let my people go. And Jehovah calls the Israelites, quote, his firstborn. Oh, that's interesting. 
That is, I've made everybody, Egyptians and Jews alike, but I particularly have an interest as a father in these Jewish people who are slaves. Maybe that's what he meant. The Old Testament frequently speaks of Israel in terms of its being a son. Uh, Moses told Pharaoh, this is what God says, let my son go so that he may go out into the desert and worship me. And of course, this is the deeper meaning that goes into the New Testament where we are all called sons and daughters of God if we believe in Jesus. So a son of God is a person created by God, that's everybody. It's a person on whom God has set his special love like the Israelites in the New Testament like Christians. But a third use of the term son of God is about a descendant of David, a king in the line of who would be the Messiah. David himself is called the son of God in the Bible. <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily then imply divinity to call someone the son of God, but it can refer to the person who is officially in the line of kings who would become Messiah eventually. The fourth use of son of God in the Bible is it's used for a per person whose nature is divine himself, who is deity himself. Just like the Bible calls certain people son of wicked, sons of wickedness, it means that they're characterized by wickedness, or um, sons of peace, peaceful is who they are. So to call one a son of God, sometimes in the Bible refers to a person who has God's very nature in his soul. That's the idea. <clears throat> so. One writer wrote how the, the whole purpose of the Gospel of John is to demonstrate that Jesus is both the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God. That is, he is the promised king who will write things, but he's also the pre-existent person who is God himself who became incarnate in order to save us. Now, this is most clear in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2 is puzzling when you first start reading the Bible because you tend to read the Psalms when you first start reading them as all about just you, the reader, and God. And sometimes they start talking about things that are head scratchers. So in Psalm chapter two, the Psalm is talking about how the nations are rejecting God's Messiah, God's anointed one. And immediately the right thing to think is, okay, well, this is written in the Old Testament time. The Old Testament had the Jewish people, had their kings, those kings were called anointed ones. And the nation sometimes attacked Israel, and so this psalm is probably about the, the Philistines or perhaps the Moabites or perhaps the Syrians or us Syrians that are attacking God's anointed one, God's son. And so it may just be David. But as the psalm goes on, Psalm 2, verse 8, we have God speaking to his anointed one, the king of Israel, saying this, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, and the ends of the earth, your possessions. Oh, God had never promised that to the Israelites. God had said to the Israelites, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. Here, we, here will be your borders on the north or south or east or west, and, and you'll be victorious over all your enemies around about when they attack you. But he had never promised the Old Testament people, as they understood it, that they would have the whole earth. And yet here it says, I promise you, my anointed king, that you'll possess the entire world. And then, in verse 7, this anointed king of Israel says to God, <clears throat> the Lord said to me, quote, you are my son, and today I have become your father. He doesn't mean I've become your father the way that an earthly father now uh, through his wife gives birth to a child, he means that at the coronation of this king, I now consider you my son in a deep and special way, deeper than any human son could be. The idea here then is that this passage is talking about someone who is spoken to by God as both the Messiah and the Messiah who has God's own nature. That's the idea of it. So when Peter said that you were the son of God, he's saying something pretty high. And then if you trace the uses of the term son of God all through the Gospels, it really gets interesting. The term son of God is used 82 times in the Gospels. It was by far the favorite term that Jesus used for himself. 
And every of those times but one, it was used by Jesus of himself. And the one time it wasn't, other people were quoting to him what he had said. So, the Son of God is what he said to himself. Jesus is called the Son of God at his baptism when the heavens open and from heaven you hear a voice, this is my Son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. The temptations in the wilderness that Jesus endured to turn stones into bread or to throw himself from the temple pinnacle and have the angels hold him up so he doesn't dash his foot against a stone. Those temptations by Satan assume that Jesus is the Son of God in this unique, divine, totally high sense. Satan didn't say, if you are the Messiah, turn stones to bread. Because the Messiah, as far as the Old Testament had it, could have been a mere man, a glorious man, a great man, a man anointed with all the power of God's Spirit to do wonderful things, but could have been a mere man who himself would have descendants, and in that way his throne would last forever. But no, Satan said, if you are the Son of God, do these things. What he's saying is this, Jesus, I know that you claim to be divine and equal with God. Well, if that is so, prove it by some of these miracles I'm going to suggest to you. And what, what Satan was suggesting is this, that Jesus would win people by doing the miracles that only a godlike person could do instead of coming to suffer like Jesus had come to do. That was the whole idea. The demons recognized Jesus as the Son of God. They didn't say, for instance, in, in, uh, in the synagogue, where during the middle of the service, a demoniac is screaming and yelling and writhing on the floor, and uh, Jesus commands the demon to leave. As Jesus is interacting with this demon-possessed man, the demons in him say, Mark 1, what do you want with us, Jesus Messiah? No, no, that's not what they say. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This recognition that Jesus was totally divine on the part of demons did not come simply because they've observed him. They watched him. He turns water into wine. Oh, that's pretty spectacular. He, uh, he heals somebody from leprosy. Oh, man, that's pretty good. He raises some from the dead. Boy, he must be God. No, 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 no. The demons intuitively sensed it. They, being from the spirit world, knew right away when he came onto the scene, walked into the room, walked down the street where they were, they knew intuitively this is divinity in human flesh. And so the term son of God is not just equal to the term Messiah. Messiah is a great term, but son of God is infinitely higher. The Messiah, someone said, is the son of David, who will establish God's kingdom on the earth at the end of time. But Jesus is the Son of God, who has power over the entire spiritual world. Jesus can be the Messiah, is qualified to be the Messiah, because he is the divine Son of God. As the Son of God, he knows God in a way nobody else knows him. Remember what he said in Matthew 11, verse 27? No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son reveals him. That is why Jesus is able to be the Messiah. It's one of the reasons. It's because he knows God perfectly and therefore can be the mediator to come and explain to people exactly who God is, show by his own life what God is like. And so, here's the idea then. The New Testament takes one of the Psalms, and it applies it to Jesus in a way that blew people's minds who were familiar with the Old Testament. It comes from Mark chapter 12, verse 35. When Jesus was teaching in the temple, he asked, how is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David, the mere descendant of David? Because David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, quote, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand 
until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls his descendant Lord. How then can he be his son? That's how he can be his son. It is a descendant of David who is the Messiah, but far greater than just the Messiah, who is the eternal son of God. In other words, the Messiah must be a supernatural being who is seated at God's right hand, and he's at the same time an earthly man, a descendant of David, and at the same time, he's going to come and judge the world, all wrapped together in the same passage. And finally, at the end of his life, <clears throat> when Jesus stood before the Jewish leaders on the night of his crucifixion and the next morning, we read in Mark 14, 61, the high priest asked him again, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Now, we have no idea if the high priest thought that the coming Messiah would be the actual Son of God, I suspect very possibly no. But he'd heard Jesus make the claim, so he used the two things that Jesus claimed. Are you the Messiah? Are you the very deity of heaven that is equal with God the Father as you claim? And Jesus says in Mark, I am. And we read then that they accused him of blasphemy. If he merely claimed to be the Messiah, they could accuse him, accuse him of fraudulence. They could accuse him of impersonation. But it would almost certainly not have met with a death sentence because other messiahs arose. No, no, no. The idea was that David's son, the Messiah, would rule the world, as someone has said. But as God's son, he was to rule the world to come. Now then, when Peter then says... You are the Messiah, and you are the Son of God. Peter's confession matched the term that Jesus used most frequently for himself. It's the term that Jesus opens up the passage with when he says, um, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The Son of Man is, of all these terms, to me, the most poignant, I guess I would say, as I say, some 82 times um, son of man is used. It can mean merely a man or a human. We read, for instance, that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. It's just another way of saying a human being. But the background to Jesus' use of the term son of man is the book of Daniel, written centuries before Christ lived in chapter 7, beginning with verse 13. The book of Daniel, you may recall, has these mysterious visions. And in verse, chapter 7, here's what happens. In chapter 7, Daniel sees a vision of four beasts. They're called animal-like creatures with horrific, grotesque features about them that make them more scary than any animal on earth. And they come out of the sea one by one, and they stand symbolically for four pagan empires that, that are going to rule the earth chronologically. And then we read after these four beasts come out of the sea, and we're meant to be put off by it and, and grossed out by it and, and um, repelled by it. We read in Daniel 7, 13, and then in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. The idea here is, after seeing creatures that are so hideous and are so repulsive to us, a being comes in the vision who is like us. He's like a human. He's like a son of man. And yet he's clearly higher than a mere human because it says, before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And all through the Bible, Clouds are associated with the glory of God the Father himself. This being now, coming with clouds of heavens, approaches the Ancient of Days, very God, a very God, God the Father sitting on his throne. He approaches him boldly, and we read that he was led right into his presence. Understand, this is at a time when there is still on the earth no way to enter into God's presence. The temple has been destroyed by these pagan empires. And when there was a temple, nobody could go back into the Holy of Holies where the covenant of God, where the ark was there, and where the atonement cover was. Because if you did, you would drop dead on the spot. And yet this man is led right into the presence of 
the Ancient of Days, and this Son of Man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and all peoples and nations and men of every language worshiped him. All this is language that you could only use of God to be worshiped, to have sovereignty, that everybody in the world worship you and that you have glory. To speak that of anyone who isn't God would be blasphemy. But it's said of this, son of man, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What's happening in this vision is this. Here's going to come a world empire, then another, and then another. Each one is worse than the one before, and finally it'll get so bad that the last one is the most hideous one, and then I see a vision of what will come after this. A son like us of man will rise, but he will be fully divine with all the power and glory of God the Father, and then everyone in the world will delightedly worship him, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. Why did Jesus constantly then refer to himself not as the Messiah? He never used that term, as I recall, of himself. Why did he always use the term of himself, the Son of Man? And I, as, as almost everybody says who writes on this, it's because his mission on this earth was one that was so much greater than what the average person thought the Messiah would do that he knew the term would be misunderstood and limited. He had to find something different. People thought the Messiah is just a man. They thought he was just a king, better than the average, but just a man perhaps, a really great man. But no, no, no. Here, Jesus used the term son of man for this. On the one hand, remember we said that the term can be used just to be a human, a, a person who participates in, in mankind, of humanity. And if people were resistant in their hearts and they wanted to believe he was no divinity, he was just human, fine. I'll use the term, I'm the son of man. It's exactly the term God had used all the way through the book of Ezekiel. Whenever God spoke from heaven to the prophet Ezekiel, he called him son of man, meaning Ezekiel, I'm going to show you all kinds of heavenly beings and cherubim. I'm going to show you my throne, but you, sir, are just a human being. Remember that you are a son of man. If people want to take it like that, fine. Take it like that. Go ahead, resist, disbelieve. We'll meet at the end of time when I'm your judge. But at the same time, by calling himself the son of man, he's making this exalted claim of his absolute majesty and supernatural divinity and infinite glory and greatness. And yet, by using the term son of man, he allows himself he allows himself to use a term that allows him to fill it with the meaning he knows it has because nobody was thinking about the fact that the coming great person would suffer. The Messiah certainly wouldn't suffer unless it's in war when he's defeating his enemies and some great son of man from the clouds in Daniel is a great and glorious person, but he wants to show that this great and glorious person is the son of man because while he's on earth, he is going to take human flesh, human form, and he's going to suffer in the manner that Isaiah 53 talked about. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The punishment that was deserved by us fell upon him and with his stripes we will be healed. And so once the disciples grasped that he was indeed the promised Messiah, he enlarged their understanding to understand what he meant by the term son of man, that he was first to die and suffer as a man, but then he would come in the clouds of glory as described in Daniel 7 and would inaugurate the kingdom of God over the entire earth and make everything good again. So that's the idea behind it. Peter then, as they were at the, on that mountainside, far from the most of the Jewish people where they could be alone, Peter, who had inklings of it throughout the Gospels, you see this. The other disciples had inklings about the Gospel. Early in the Gospel of John, they called him the Messiah, but they didn't get it all. It's like the light has switched on after seeing this man for three and a half years. Peter looks and says, oh my goodness. I, I'm talking to the Messiah. And beyond that, I'm talking to the Son of God from 
Daniel chapter 7. And so he bowed before what he knew, and he was commended for it. Now, of course, the passage says that nobody can grasp these things intuitively without God opening their ears, their hearts, their mind. Jesus says, Simon, verse 17, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. He's saying, he's saying Simon, you were raised by a man named Jonah. Jonah may have been a good Jew. Jonah may have gone to the synagogue weekly. Jonah may have teed you on the Bible, but Jonah could not make you realize these things on his own. He was saying, uh, Peter, you could go to seminary for the rest of your life. You could earn multiple PhDs in various theological subjects, and you would not get what you just said in a way that's actually saving. You did not learn from mortal man. It was not from your own nature, but my heavenly Father revealed this truth to you. <clears throat> That's the idea behind it. What God has to do to make a person truly born again, saved, eternally forgiven, a son of God who is going to heaven, what God has to do is to give a person the understanding that Jesus is absolutely unique. And having given him that understanding, another part of being regenerated is making the person like the fact be drawn by the fact, be attracted to the fact that Jesus is the unique Son of God who says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The Pharisees saw all that Peter saw, that Jesus did, much of it anyway, and they rejected Jesus. Judas saw almost everything that Peter saw about Jesus, and he rejected Jesus. It's not just the seeing these things or hearing these things does it. Faith is an intuitive trust from being drawn to someone, and that attraction can only come as the Holy Spirit sent from God the Father melts a person's heart and draws them. And we learn that Peter got it because, well, what Jesus had said in Matthew eleven twenty-five. 25, Jesus had prayed some time ago, Father, I thank you because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and you have revealed them to little children. I've probably told you this account many years ago in another sermon on another topic, but it's worth repeating here. Years ago, a man and his wife started attending our church. We were still in the old sanctuary, and they had been involved in churches, but they went to liberal churches where you basically heard about a mush God, and you never heard about atonement <clears throat> that was required by blood in order to forgive your sins. And so they came, and they were interested, and they were intrigued by the people here. Apparently, those of you who were here were kind to them and made them feel at home, and they were welcome. They enjoyed the services, but they were scratching their heads, and they couldn't get it. In particular, the wife couldn't get it. So the wife thought, I, I've got to understand what these people are talking about better. And so she started t talking to people, meeting with them for coffee. Tell me what you believe. I, I, I don't get it. What am I supposed to believe again? How is it that a person becomes right with God? She couldn't quite get it. Well, then they started a Bible study, and she was in a women's Bible study, and she still couldn't get it. And then the women's Bible study went through the book of Romans. Romans is the clearest expression of the gospel, the most systematic treatment of it in the entire Bible. She's going through the book of Romans week by week. She can't get it. Several people told her, just do it. Just, just Nike. Uh, just up and believe. Up and believe what? Uh, up and believe how? She could not get it. I don't know the date. I don't know where she was physically. But one day as she's going about doing whatever she's doing, it comes to her. Oh my goodness. He's a Messiah. He's a son of God. He's absolute deity. And yet simultaneously, he is a suffering son of man who pays for my sins on the cross. And yet a glorious son of man who's coming back in glory to judge the world, but to declare me innocent and to take me home to be with him. And she was strongly converted. Blessed are you, Laura, for this has not come to you by humans, but it was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. That's the way it works. So Jesus said, 
in our passage. Those who have come to understand Jesus are supremely fortunate because he says, Simon, blessed are you. You are a fortunate man indeed. I think about uh, a young man who has now been raised in this church and is married, lives in another state now. Some of you know him. His name is Hunter Stoltzis. Hunter, I'm guessing, is in his 30s. But when he was growing up, he was 11. He's just a boy, a normal boy, active. It's not like he is known for fasting and praying night and day or any such thing. He's just a guy. He's just a kid. And he's on a three-wheeled vehicle on vacation, and he goes over a cliff. And when people find him, his face is in the water, and he looks like he's drowned and gone. Miraculously, um, he's revived just enough to keep him alive, and they get him out of there and take him to a trauma center. And he has a traumatic brain injury. His skull is crushed. Titanium planes are put into his head in order to keep the brain swelling from um, happening terribly. His lungs are compromised because of the near drowning. And so the doctors put him in a drug-induced coma in order to calm his body. When he comes out of the drug-induced coma, his mother and his father are there. What are the first words of an 11-year-old boy who's been unconscious for a long, long time? He looks at them and he says, are you a Christian? And his second word to them is, do you know Jesus? Will you help me to know Jesus? Hunter Stoltzfus, blessed are you, for these things did not come to you from human wisdom or teaching or skill, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed it to you. You are supremely blessed. And finally, in our passage, the two verses we skipped, of which we will spend one sentence on, are in verse 18 and 19, when immediately following this wonderful display of who he is, Jesus is now telling where it's going to go. I tell you, Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. What we have talked about is the foundation of Jesus' great plan for the world, that is to build the Christian church, the pillar and ground of these truths that we are talking about. And starting next week, we will look as to what he says about the institution that he has formed to be the treasure chest in which these priceless truths are contained and made safe and then given as appropriate to the whole world. Would you bow your heads and pray for yourself and for someone else? As we are praying, to any of you who cannot say that you have ever consciously did what Peter did and confessed what he confessed, you do need to do that. And you were able to do it as we sit here. You were able as you sit here to say to God, God, I... I have never cared about these things. I certainly have never been interested, and I've certainly never yielded to them. But I want to stop resisting you. 
I want to lay down my sword that's fighting you. I want to yield my life to you and ask you to take over me, change me, forgive me, save me, make me a son or daughter of God, make me indwelt by the unique Son of God. May the Jesus who was the suffering Savior on the cross be my judge and declare me not guilty on the great day because may his death have covered my sin. I confess and believe in you. Do that as you sit, or do that as you drive home, or do that this afternoon, but do that. And for those of you who are his, thank him that the grace for you to be that confessor did not come from yourselves, but it was revealed to you by your Father in heaven. Lord, your gospel is high above us. <clears throat> we only look at the edges of it, but we thank you for the little bit we can see. We pray that you will give us more and more insight into who you are and the grandeur of your Son, that he would cease being to us just a one-dimensional, rather shallow, isolated part of our lives, but that we would think of him as the absolute center of everything in the universe and that our lives would revolve around him with wonder and joy and worship and service. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Messiah, the Son of God, be with every true believer in this room. Amen.